Welcome to the Bodybuilding Banter Podcast, your number one source of all things bodybuilding. Be sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on future episodes. Now, here's your host, Leroy Rollins. Let's, uh, let's kick this thing off. Um, welcome to the podcast again. This is kind of Thank a... You. A return episode. I've been so damn busy that I haven't been able to do these things. So, uh, welcome everybody to another episode of the Bodybuilding Banter Podcast. I am here with Brett Freeman, WMBF champion, pro bodybuilder. How you doing, my man? Good, man. Thank you for that intro. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of cinematic. I, I, I like I, it. <laughs> I know. It was epic. So, uh, for those that don't know who you are, which I'm going to assume most viewers of the podcast do, but for the one guy that's like, who's this Brett dude, uh, what are you all about, my man? Uh, I'm about the glutes, apparently. <laughs> I mean, condi- conditioning, um, I, I'm a bandweight world champion. I have won two world titles, lightweight class in 2017 and 2019. 2019, uh, I had help from... Our coach, actually, yeah. Mr. Cliff Wilson. So, The man, the great, myth, the legend. <laughs> great guy. Great, great guy. So what I want to chat with you about, man, is what it takes to get from advanced to elite. Um, I think that is something that for me and my stage of career, I want to learn about, um, you know, because that's, that's my goal is to bridge that gap from where I am to hopefully where... You know, you you were in your uh, most recent stages of your career. So, um, what what would you say was the biggest thing that changed between you from going amateur to pro? Oh man, um, I would say getting a bit more strategic with my training approach. Yep. But then on the flip side, not overcomplicating it as much as people tend to do nowadays. Yeah. If I, I've noticed a trend with uh, your training. It's it's kind of taken a more simplistic approach. Yeah. And I'm unsure, but I think you've reaped quite well, a bit of benefits from it. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um. That's that's not a knock on uh, volume at all. But I do I do think people lose sight of the forest in regards to undermining training performance, since that is pretty damn important. Yeah. Especially, especially going from that beginner, novice to intermediate to advanced level, because if if you take a look at all of the advanced athletes, at the, even at the world stage or even in the pro ranks, the pound for pound, they are strong as hell. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, even look at even look at amateurs like AJ Morris, uh, Chris McCready. Oh. <laughs> they are. They, I'm yeah, like sure, they are. I'm all, pretty sure Chris is an alien from another planet, but that's for Chris, another. Chris test, had, so. he has like a Miles Stanton genetic mutation. I'm pretty sure he's like a ethics, Belgian so. blue bull. <laughs> he has to be just yeah. like uh, uh, I forgot his name, Keon. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Kenyon, Kenyon, Josh. Kenyon. Oh Josh, yeah, he's a freak. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think the biggest leap was just um starting to prioritize things that I otherwise didn't. So I, I skated by quite a bit from my amateur all the way up to turning pro uh, with really piss poor nutrient timing, uh, just poor, poor choices with nutrition. I was super pro if it fits your macros, Yeah. which no knock on that. Like it can get you lean, but I do think there is a different look uh, when you do uh, keep your food sources a bit more uh, consistent. Yeah, I agree. So to, so to speak. And then my training, my training evolved over time. It's, it's still a bit similar to how I did train in my earlier years. Yeah. It, it was a bit more powerlifting focused with hardly any accessory or hypertrophy work. Yep. So just prioritizing uh, more bodybuilding focused intensive work into my training program i find uh it's ironic but training is almost the o- most overlooked aspect of this whole thing everybody's yeah. worried about you know nutrition and like like you know you even mentioned like nutrient timing and all when when yeah. how quick after a workout do we need a protein shake you know how, how long before bed before i'm gonna mess with my blood sugar levels overnight and not get a good night's sleep and 
supplement timing and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, how are your workouts? Blah, I just do whatever. Shit. Wait, what? Shit. Yeah, right? For, for lack of a better term, yeah. a lot of people just don't train really all that well, not not to mention hard. We, we There's a prerequisite to like if you train good, you're probably going to train hard. But most people don't even have solid training to even get training hard from. To facilitate that growth. That's that right. is necessary to grow. Yeah. And, and again, that's not a knock on people that train with reps and reserve or train with an RPE of six to eight. Yep. But I, I, I do think uh, people tend to grow a bit more when they do focus solely on not necessarily beating the logbook, but progressive overload. Yeah, yeah. So that's something and, that me and you kind of just went back and forth on Instagram a few times about. And it's like getting back to the basics and, you know, you're yep. you're kind of in a similar situation I am where you, you got a barbell to play with, um, some cables, and, and that's really it. So you're doing a lot of you know, squat, bench, deadlift kind of stuff. And for me, like, like you mentioned before, like that is, you know, getting back to almost my roots. I was always a fan of, you know, I guess power building, so to speak. Like I always, I always would typically go like heavy on a compound and then, you know, a higher rep range for the isolation stuff. So for me, this is really not anything new, but it's something that I kind of got away from, I guess you could say. Yep. And it's, it's really crazy how coming back to it how things are just like like going, and there's a ton of other things I'm taking more seriously now with recovery and nutrient timing, like all the other small things that yeah. make up good bodybuilding. But I think as a whole, my training is the biggest thing that's that's just going. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's it's shown in your physique. I mean, the past three four months. Yeah. I mean, I know there was I know there was a post show rebound period, but still, like that that amount of progress is. That's absurd. Yeah, which so I can't complain. <laughs> no, no, exactly. And a funny thing too, I I could go to a commercial gym. They're they're open in uh, New York, yeah. but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I, I kind of want to prove people wrong that you can grow off of the basics at a advanced at an advanced level, kind of like Jeff Helbers would. Yeah, yeah. So, that's kind of uh, something that I've had in my brain too. Is like I'm going to build this kind of little machine here in my garage and then unveil it in a year and a half and people be like what the hell and i'm be like yeah this is my garage <laughs> did you go to dubai no no didn't go to dubai <laughs> didn't, didn't have time for that so oh with God. um training do you think that why do you think people aren't doing maybe what they should why aren't or are aren't. like why is the you know, general populace of bodybuilders not maybe giving the most attention to what you think is important. Uh, I don't want to say misinformation, but information that might confirm their bias. And training hard is difficult. It, it takes you out of your comfort zone. And if somebody thinks that they can progress on four, three, two IR they're going to yep and taking a few sets to actual failure it sucks it's hard it's not fun but it, it does produce results yeah now i noticed in again this is like not throwing salt or anything at you know the scientists that are you know putting out great research and articles etc but the past three years i feel like there has been a trend that training hard you don't have to do it. You yeah. can take more of a conservative, conservative, passive approach. Yeah. Where, as I, there is just a different look to the physiques that do train with this approach. That's yeah. my opinion. And that's what I think is possibly holding back some of these amateurs from, you know, developing into a pro. Yeah. But it depends. <laughs> yeah. I've had a similar chat with Cliff about that actually. So with him right now, uh, we've just been doing like every kind of six to eight to 10 weeks, we'll do like a video call. Um, yeah. I'll send him photos, you know, we'll go over things. How's everything looking? What's next steps kind of deal. And I said kind of near the beginning of my off season, cause I, I knew what I was going to have to play with equipment wise, which was going to buy default, refer me back to a lot of basics. I'm going to be deadlifting, squatting, benching, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I said, like, do you do you honestly think you see a, a visual difference in people that do these big 
hard, heavy movements, like guys that are squatting four and five plates, guys that are deadlifting, you know, 500 plus pounds for reps, like you see a difference. And he said, you know, I don't exactly know why, but yes, the guys that, I mean, and and that runs from natural and enhanced. Like you look at guys like Dorian and how they Ronnie Coleman, Ronnie Coleman, you know, even guys, you know, James Hollingshead nowadays, Luke Sando before he passed. Yeah. They all have this look. And then, you know, that carries over into the natural stream where, you know, pros like yourself and even amateurs like, uh, Chris McCready, like you mentioned, Josh there, like they all have this look to them and you look at their training and you're like, okay, I'm seeing some trends here. You know, they're not doing a lot of like fluff work and, and you know, they're taking a lot of stuff to failure sometimes beyond, but look at their physiques. Like how can I, like for me anyways, when I look at those people and I'm like, okay, they're training this way and they look how I want to look. I'm going to yeah. put two and two together and I'm going to do those things. Mm-hmm. No, I know it might not be that, that could all, people could also argue, well, genetics and in spite of what they do do, they're going to get there. But I, I do think success leaves clues. Yep. So yeah. if, if, if you, I mean, even if we date it back to the 1900s when barbells were the only thing that people could train with, yep. They also had very dense looking physiques. That's right. And then it carried on into the you know 60s, 70s, and 80s. And then as soon as machines, cables, and all of this equipment started entering into bodybuilding, I, I want to say there was a shift in the look. And if we're talking IFBB, this could be dependent on the you know the gear that they were using. For sure. But I feel like physiques did start to change. I mean, you had Dorian, Flex, Sean Ray. All of those physiques trained differently, but Dorian looked like he was carved out of like granite. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, same. I mean, same with uh, Marcus Rule. Same with Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. And then you had somebody like Jay Cutler, who phenomenal physique, but d- just didn't have that level of density, so to speak. Yep. When they would turn him around and compare him against Ronnie. Yeah. And I- I've noticed that throughout, even in even in the WMBF, I've. I remember going as a teen in 2009 and being able to see, you know, the top pros like Brian Whitaker, Sean Clarita, uh, Jim Cordova. Yep. And you could, you could tell like the density that Brian had oh. from the backside, you could tell he, de- he pulled from the floor, he squatted. Whereas Cordova, maybe not so much. Yep. Clarita did somewhat. Yep. He, he does more so now, but the physiques just looked, they look way different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think like, uh, it's, it's a, it's a level of, you know, intensity and effort that, like you said, I I don't know if everybody's willing to go that far. You know what I mean? Like, I know, like for me anyways, like the way I'm training and now trying to explain to a lot of my clients how I expect them to train and then we train together and they're like, Oh, (laughs) this, this is what you mean by that. I'm like, yes, like this is exactly what it should look like why because in a year's time you're going to look very different right so that's just it yeah and i don't think every set has to be taken to actual mechanical failure no but your 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 first rep should look a shit ton slow your last rep should look a lot slower than your first rep yeah I, i feel like yeah i think that uh you know that's something like the whole train to failure thing people think it's black and white yeah i'm a fan of like train to failure pick your battle know when to know when not to um you know i'm not gonna take a squat to failure to where i'm gonna bury it um it's not fun (laughs) no it's not especially when you don't got catchers and you're just hoping your buddy behind you is gonna you know help you on the way up but like you know, isolation stuff for sure, machine work yeah. for sure, but you know that people just ignore that and they're like, "Oh, I trained a failure, or I don't." Well, no, like it's not, it's not like that. <laughs> no, no. And like, there's, there's, it's, it's again, it's like so black and white. It's like if if I train a failure, then every single set has to be taken to failure. Yeah. Whereas it's no, we're just trying to uh, put forth a level of effort towards every set. Yeah. So you're not sandbagging it or just going through the motions. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Um, what about uh, like frequency and volume and stuff like that? Has that changed over the course of your career? Like, you know, speaking for me personally, I yeah. trained, you know, historically like six days a week was always a sweet spot, but me doing five right now and being smart with rest days, like always resting after legs has done me really well. Like, is there anything like that that you've kind of adopted in the later part of your career? It, I mean, in, in the beginning it was very, it was always, since I had Eric Helms and Berto, you know, behind me guiding, uh, muscle groups were always trained at least two to three times per week. Yep. And then I did notice with powerlifting, obviously that's, you know, more specific. So the movements were performed three to four times per week. But in regards to bodybuilding, um, I did start toying around with uh, higher frequency, mainly due to uh, uh, James Krieger, uh, Mike Isretel, and all of them kind of showing that muscle groups do recover a bit faster. Yep. But So I started playing around with that in 2017, 2018, 2019, and then post-Worlds last year, I decided to get a little bit more uh, nuanced with it. So I, I kind of went a little overboard. So arms were getting trained four to five times per week. Oof. Legs getting trained two times per week, chest three to four, Yeesh. back three to four. And then I would progress sets throughout the mesocycle, you know, re regardless of anything. <laughs> and what I, what I noticed personally was I overreached a little too much yeah. and recovery was shit. Did I grow? I'm unsure. <laughs> so so, so, so I, sat, I sat down, I sat down with myself and I'm like, my, my like, Level of strength. I, I don't think it's it's. I'm capable of training that frequently and being able to recover. So I'm basically just shooting myself in the foot, yeah. digging a deeper recovery hole. And over the past three to four months, I went with kind of a modified push pull legs. Mm -hmm. So four to five times per week, more recovery. Uh, frequency still two to about two. Two times per week for arms, yep. but redu reduced entirely yep. compared to before, and boom, growing. So yeah. that's that's uh, is there a, is there a correlation? Yes. I'm unsure. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. That's one thing I, I actually spoke with uh, AJ about because uh, you know his posterior chains developed a yep. lot, and I said like I had recently bought a hack squat a couple weeks ago, and I said okay, it's going in somewhere. I just need to figure out where. Um, and I was doing two leg days a week. Um, I had two kind of main compounds each day. The one day was the stiff leg deadlift I was running with. And then like a plate loaded, ha uh, I don't know what to call it, a hack squat. It was basically just a plate loaded squat yeah. with the shoulder pads. And then on the other leg day was my barbell squat and leg press. So I was like, okay, like, so I messaged him and I was like, Hey man, uh, you know, where do you suggest I, I want to keep my deadlift in? I don't want to take away from the other things. Where do you suggest? And his first thing, kind of similar to what you mentioned there, he's like, man, you're like where your strength's at is kind of the biggest determining factor because you need to be able to recover. He's like, if someone wasn't, you know, necessarily pulling, like if you're pulling 500 pounds, like that's going to take a toll. So you need to kind of plan things accordingly. So he's like, I would personally do it on pull day and then you can do, you, you can fit your hack in on one of your leg days. So this week was my first week back on this new kind of new structured split. So I did deadlifts yesterday, only one set, um, a four to six, and then the rest of the pole workout as kind of normal. And then today, so then today when I woke up, like woke up, I was like, okay, today's the test. Am I fatigued from that deadlift or am I good? And knock on wood, no issues. Lower back was Thanks. fine. It was only one set. So I think that was a huge factor, but kind of gave me my, not only like my deadlift fix for me mentally, cause I want to do it, but also like that hip hinge progression that I'm going to continue to chase. And then it didn't negatively affect anything else. So when it comes to like recovery and rest, that's honestly the other biggest thing that I think matters. Someone asked me, they're like, what's the most like, I don't know, underrated thing with your training and stuff. And I was like, sleep. <laughs> and, and I am terrible at that. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> sleep, sleep is, sleep is one of, whenever I see performance decrease with a client, 
how have you been sleeping? Yeah. You've been nailing, you know, your food to a T, you know, getting in every single session, but you're sleeping sub X hours. Yeah. Boom. Most likely the reason. Do you have any sleep hacks that you've used over the years? Oh man. Um, <laughs> it was, it was at its worst last year in prep, which as it always is. Yeah. But I ended up, um, so researching it quite a bit, I ended up using, let me think, uh, ashwagandha, yep. L-theanine, magnesium. I didn't use glycinate, but I used naturally calm, which helped quite a bit. That's um, the powder, right? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep, we have that. I, I actually, I think I uh, discovered this from Matt Jansen, but taking it in between meals as well when you're pretty lean helps with uh, digestion. Okay. Which was pretty cool. Um, melatonin, obviously. Uh, and good old sleep aids. <laughs> <laughs> some uh, some night Not natty. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, diphenhydramine, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Spell, ch- spell check. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, check that. <laughs> um, so training aside, let's talk about nutrition strategies. Um, what's changed from when you were an amateur to a pro? Uh, food choices, food timing, you know, all the other little things that have went into it. Yeah. I'm not eating pop tarts five times a day and just hitting my macros that way. So. Tricks of the trade right there. <laughs> Dude, uh, micro deficiencies are not fun. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. But yeah, I, I was super, super pro if it fits your macros. If you ever want to look at my 2011 pictures, I was even holding up pictures of like pancake mix. <laughs> with almost dried glutes, nice. I looked emaciated like a swimmer. Yep. But um, 2017, I started to prioritize it a little bit. Still would fit in uh, way too many things that shouldn't have been within somebody's diet while they're contest prepping, right. especially pre worlds. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I was eating, I was eating low fat ice cream a few days out, which did have a negative effect on how I looked. Yeah. And then 2019, um, due to my work schedule, I was very flexible in regards to eating and nutrient timing. But then towards the latter half of prep, when I started to work with Cliff, I wanted to experiment. And I started, uh, I ended up writing down a meal plan for myself. Yep. And lo and behold, much more consistent weigh-ins, much more consistent look week to week, um, performance and workouts went upwards yep. and so after so post show after worlds in 2019 um same thing i decided to be a bit more uh, like an adult with my food <laughs> you need <And> vegetables <laughs> yeah yo dude that that is one thing that cliff like was on my ass about he's hardcore about that stuff like i i on one of our calls <laughs> or one of our calls we did i think this is the most recent one probably like a month ago now and he was like um, I was talking to him about like th- things that bodybuilders overlook and he was like micronutrients. He's like, oh, yeah. we're always about macros, total calories, blah, blah. He's like, but not enough bodybuilders eat like their fruits and vegetables. So ever since that day, I've been taking greens in the morning. Uh, he was talking about like he would make a, a priority for himself to have like fruit a couple times a day. So I'm doing that now too. And obviously yeah. in the off season, I got the calories to just willy nilly and play where like I can have an apple and some grapes and it's not going to mess with my calories at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I agree, like it's, it's stuff that he was very adamant about for sure. No. And it, I mean, it, it helped tremendously. I mean, with digestion, just with, with consistent, uh, energy levels and yep. gl- glucose levels, not crashing. That, that was another thing he, uh, changed my mind a bit about was when I first started working with him, he brought my fat intake up carbs down. So I've always been a very moderate to high carb uh, person. So into the off season, I started to play around with not low carb, but moderate, but increasing my fat intake. Okay. Which has helped quite a bit. I've it might be anecdotal, just with uh, recovery, with my joints feel a oh, yeah. shit ton better. Interesting. Um, I'm not as lethargic as I would be at this body weight which Whoa. has helped training performance quite a bit. What would your intake be in fat? Uh, la- last I checked, I don't, I track intuitively. Yeah. yeah. So 
but last I checked, it's around 80 to 100 fat. Oh, yeah, so that that's relatively high in, in most yeah. people anyways. Whereas I used to keep it sub-70 in the off-season, yeah. which, yeah. <laughs> Car- carbs are around three to 500. Proteins higher than most would yep. be in the off-season. That's another personal preference. Yep. Um, but, okay. but yeah, nutrient timing, though, it's most likely very similar to yours. Uh, I eat every two to four hours. Most body et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bodybuilder things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Is there anything <laughs> that you used to do that you don't do now? Oh man, I don't max out every single session. <laughs> I don't work. I don't work up to a one rep max. <laughs> That's fair. I that that was a a bad habit of mine from two thousand nine to like two thousand twelve. <laughs> Just three years of PRs, <laughs> dude. It was bad. It was it was terrible. It was so bad. Were you progressing at all, like, when you would max I, out? I was. I would add five pounds every week. <laughs> Damn. Damn. <laughs> and, then I would, and then I would do no back offsets and wonder why I didn't grow. So. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. Is there any, uh, outside of Pop-Tarts, is there any, like, food choices that you've really juggled around over the years? Uh, that, that I liked, or? Just, like, like I know for me, um, I'm, like, chicken and rice like ground beef and potato like i have like staple meals that i've had basically my entire bodybuilding career that i just always have is there anything like that that you a have always had and then b used to have that don't anymore i've always been a big uh sludge or whey pudding and cereal person cereals have changed over time it used to be much more refined now it's cheerios i love cheerios plain I'm on um, Frosted Flakes right now. Damn, they're good. Ooh, those are so good. Oh, they are. I was, I was so Cheerio, good. I was Cheerios always through, like, contest preps, just because that was, like, the coach that I had at the time. That's what he yeah. would always have me on. It was Cheerios, and then I was like, okay, cool. And it was awesome. And then in the off season, I was like, well, I'm going to have a different cereal. And then I, I, like, had Frosted Flakes for the first time in, like, four years. And I was like, holy, what? this is amazing. <laughs> That's how Reese Puffs are after not yeah. having them for so long. Legit. But, yeah, beef and potatoes, uh, yeah, chicken and rice. I would say Pop-Tarts and, man, that's a hard question. I want to say ice cream, too, because I am I am somewhat lactose intolerant, so I know I should stay away from that shit. Yeah. But in the off-season, I get a little too flexible sometimes. <laughs> so you, you're, uh, right now... In the off season, would you say your day to day? You said it's intuitive, but is your day to day pretty similar? Yeah, it's clockwork, pretty much. Yeah, it's, yeah. That's, I tell people uh, lot, it's like Groundhog Day, like over and over and over. Yeah, and when you when you weigh things, when you weigh food on a scale for such a long time, oh yeah, you can see it. <laughs> you, yeah, you can see it. I can eyeball 128 grams of chicken. So I mean, or yeah. 112. Sorry. <laughs> that that. What was that? 16 grams real makes a difference. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. So in the off season, um, what's been, uh, I guess, the biggest changes from now to previous off seasons? Is there anything that you put more focus on now and anything that you put less focus on now? I think I, I've had a uh, lot more consistency because between – 2017 and 2019 I had quite a I had a few periods where I didn't train due to life life circumstances yeah. and work circumstances so from 2019 till now it's been the most uh, even despite quarantine and lockdown and not having a gym for three months I would say it's been the most stable off season to date and just falling back in love with the basics yeah which I mean, dating back to my early training career, which th- those were the movements that I only performed, they work. Now, they might not work for everybody, but they they, they do work. Yep. Yeah, I think like those uh, those bread and butter movements, you know, they, yeah. they really do carry to, you know, whether you vary it up based on your mechanics or whatever, like a lot yeah. of, yeah. you know a lot of it just comes down to like basic movements, right? Like some kind of squat yeah. pattern, some kind of hip hinge, some kind of press, some kind of pull, but it's just not overthinking it and just 
you know, throwing the barbell aside because, oh, well, there's this machine that's built perfectly. Well, yeah, but. <laughs> and, and that's like no knock on machines either, but I, it's, I honestly, if, I honestly, with quarantine, I, everybody could probably, I mean, agree with this, but I feel like the gym is a luxury. I mean, we had people training with cement weights, with makeshift squat racks, and they were still able. To, yeah, exactly. My, my that whole, was sick. That was whole, dope, man. Dude, that was so dope. <laughs> oh, that was. I remember, like, so we closed down. We're going off on a tangent now, but we closed down <laughs> in in March, and here here where I live, anyways, like March can still be hit and miss with snow, and I remember, like. I think a week into the quarantine, I had built the rack up. And at the time, my fiance and I, we didn't have this house. We were in an apartment building, so I can't just bring it into my apartment building. So I stored it in my truck and I would go outside and I'd pull it off. I would do all my like accessory stuff inside because we had like a dinky little bench. So I would do leg extensions, leg curls, lunges and stuff. And then like get my bag, get my sweater on, go out get my squat rack all set up and I remember one day I had freaking it was a blizzard and I was like squatting yes. in the snow and I was like this is bullshit <laughs> but I did wasn't it. it wasn't it it was downpouring in one of them wasn't it yeah one day it was pouring was, rain yeah that was oh my god <laughs> and I was like, like I, got, I got two more sets still I'm not done yet <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but back to That's our okay. uh, original chat I was squatting and deadlifting funny <laughs> Can it, I completely what was I, I lost my train of thought uh, what were we going on about oh like machines and stuff like that and like if yeah, they're yeah, overrated yeah. in a sense I think what uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of uh, like really complex machines nowadays and like like handles and stuff and like like all this like like fancy stuff that like I don't know if it's it's making it too complicated. Like paralysis by analysis, like that term. Yes. People like not knowing what to do because there's six hundred so machines. Shit. There's so much stuff, yep. and like me and you were like, "What about this bar? <laughs> Put this bar in your well, back." <laughs> well, it's like if you go to a, a froyo place and there's you know fifty different kinds yep. of you know froyo to choose from. Which one are you going to choose? Yeah. That, that's how I feel. You know the machines are when. Uh, a newbie goes into a gym and they don't know what the hell to do. Yep. And then you point to this, this barbell looking thing and they're like, well, that doesn't look fun. No. Whereas that, that, that barbell is c- kind of like the master to the remaining, you know, machines that there are. Yeah. Um, I haven't used too many complex machines, so to speak. I've always trained in, you know, dinky upstate New York gyms. Sure. So I haven't had the, you know, the luxury of being able to train in, gyms like Dubai gym or ones in the UK. I think, I think they're great. But at the end of the day, a barbell is a barbell and a dumbbell is a dumbbell. I had a conversation actually with uh, a guy just through Instagram that was like, you know, comparing what he has access to, to what they have access to, you know, in Dubai, in a lot of those gyms in the UK. And he's like, man, I, I just feel like, I'll never get to where they are because I don't have that stuff. And I, I like, I felt so, and he was younger than me. Like I'm 27. He was younger than me. And I'm like, dude, that's what you're worried about right now. Like you're 22 and you're getting upset because all you have is a barbell, some dumbbells and cables at your local gym. And because they have all the prime fitness equipment that changes the resistance profile for you to make it match the strength profile. Like, I'm like, yeah. why are you ever worried about that right now? And and I think that's honestly probably a lot of people in his similar shoe where they're getting into the game, but they see all these, you know, quote unquote fancy things. And they're like, well, I have, it's like if you drive like a shitty car, but you see all these nice cars, you're going to feel bad about yourself. It's like, well, no, that nice car is still getting you from A to B. Right? Exactly. I can exactly. still turn pro with a barbell versus pro with a prime fitness squat press you know what i mean and it's just i don't know it's kind of sad i'd hate to feel they're, like that no it, it, it sucks because they're trying to run before they walk and what's even worse is social media nowadays especially instagram where every top pro is training with these machines 
So they think, or, you know, the, the younger kids, the teenagers, they, they see that and they think, oh, that's how I can get that physique. There, there's no other way if I don't have that machine. Yeah. When if you, you know, go, go back, you know, 5, 10, 15 years and you see how they used to train, it all started with the basics. It started with the barbells, the dumbbells, and then past a certain level of advancement, they might need these machines just due to how big they are. Yep. For instance, I have BB Pros. Um, I mean, even Dr. Mike gets not hated on, but looked down upon for using a Smith machine. Maybe not anymore, but if you look back at his, you know, training career, he was performing all of these basic barbell, you know, complex movements yeah. and strong, strong as hell in them yeah. as a natural. Yeah. I Which, agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think too, you know, you, you mentioned like Instagram and social media and stuff yeah. like, you know. I think people are probably getting tired of me posting the same workouts week after week after week, but it's, it's, you know, going back to like all these new fancy machines, like that's going to get more attention than, you know, me yep. and you posting another squat video or another oh, yeah. deadlift video. Right. But if someone's yep. doing the reverse grip, supinated, you know, thumbless preacher bench bicep curl extension, <laughs> that's going to get more attention. Right. Which I think yeah. is part of, I don't know if we can call it a problem, but maybe part of the problem where that's going to get way more traction on social media, you know, influencers that get sponsored to share this stuff, people that get, you know, paid to endorse this piece of equipment where, you know, me and you aren't going to get barbell sponsorships anytime soon. You have to do a shirtless too, but fact. With, the, that. with the belt on. So you're, you're popped out a bit. Exactly. <laughs> no, but that's, and it's, it's misleading. It's so misleading and it, and it sucks because if, if you haven't noticed, I don't have a high following, a follower count and there's reasons for that probably, but I just don't care. And if you even look back to my early years of posting, it's the same shit. It's the same squats. It's a, it's the same benching. It's yeah. same bathroom picks, <laughs> but <laughs> it, man, yeah. is he ever it, it's, not, it's not sexy. He's got the same towels from 2009. <laughs> Yo, no joke. Those green towels are... There's a long, I'm not going to go on that tangent, but anyways. <laughs> no, but it, the, the, boring, the boring is not sexy. It does not sell, but it, but it works. Yep. Yep. And I so think keep that's, posting those deadlift and squat videos. That's right. You know, and, and it comes back to like us talking about earlier. Like, it's hard. Now we've established that it's boring. You know, you, you start to figure out, well, if, if you don't really love it, I could see how you're easily pulled away. Yeah, but, yeah, no, big but time. But unfortunately, big time. That, that's at the cost of, you know, what me and you both agree on builds a certain physique that obviously we both are on the same page of what we would aim to attain. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, there's some detractions, but it's unfortunate because that's the stuff that I think really works. Yeah, I mean, another person that comes to mind is Levi Burge. Yep. He's, we just posted like a four plate <laughs> squat today, and what's he, like 50 something? Yeah, no no caption, no nothing. Train no, no today. caption, nothing. <laughs> no knee sleeves, just completely raw, just savage. Be right back, placed, you know, top three at Worlds, just yep. <laughs> another yep. day. But that's, I mean, that kids, kids, not kids, I mean, teenagers nowadays or people on social media, they, they want, they want excitement. I feel when you get to a certain level of advancement, I mean like yourself or even AJ Morris, it's like, there's, there's nothing that exciting about it. It's just the same shit over and over and over again. No, I was uh, it, ha having a conversation about a guy that I, I work with and we were talking about social media and business and stuff like that and growing your platform, growing your audience. And yeah. he's like, uh, like, how's your YouTube going? Like, you were doing, like, a lot of YouTube before. And I said, you know what, man? Like, right now, like, I've committed to these uh, Operation 2022, like, one video a week. He's like, why don't you do more? I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I would talk about. He's like, what do you mean? I said, exactly. I said, like, I have, like, I try to make, like, a topic per video. Like, whether it's a workout walkthrough or whether, like, I'll put a poll up and ask people what I want to talk about. Like, you know, off season strategies or recovery tips. And I'll, I'll blend that into the video, but it's like, it's all like, man, I do the same shit. And I also work like a pretty standard day job. Like, what am I going to put, yeah. like, what am I going to vlog all day? 
Like, oh, exactly. same meal, same meal, <laughs> same meal. Oh, I'm training. Oh, you did that workout last week. Yeah, I did it six months ago too. But like that, that's what it is, right? Like it's just repeat, 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 repeat. It's all regurgitated, not regurgitated, but it's just, unless you are putting up clickbait type stuff, yeah. it's it's just going to be the same thing over yeah. and over and over again. Yeah. And, no, uh, and like, uh, if I'm on prep because you're constantly changing and you have like, I don't know, you, you can talk about prep, like, oh, it was a good yeah, week, yeah. it was a hard week, I'm eight weeks out, I'm 12 weeks out, whatever. That definitely, you, you can play with that. But like the oh, yeah. off season, like, man, like... I'm going to post a video a week for the next year and a half and it's going to be you play the first video and the last video and the only difference is going to be like the size of my face. <laughs> oh my god. It's it's like watching paint dry. That's yeah. that's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to the fat face though during the bulk though. Love it. Yeah. I'm filling out <laughs> larges. Like I feel good. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at mediums. So – we're good. So crossing that median <laughs> threshold. <laughs> Thirteen inch pythons. Love it. But all right, man. Let's let's kind of close this out. Um, I guess closing thoughts to you know if you if you were to give like two or three main points to holy crap. You hear my phone? Is that me? Is that you? <laughs> yeah. How do I turn that off? Airplane mode. There we go. Yeah, I believe so. Um, last kind of two or three points to, to give to, give them to me. I'm trying to go from advanced to elite. We talked about that at the very beginning of the podcast. I want to be like you when I grow up. What do, what do you tell me? For me, for the next year and a half, because that's what I've got. What do I need to focus on? What do I need to stay on track with? What do I need to put least, less effort into, more effort into? You need to first fall in love with the sport. Yep. If you want to call it a sport and enjoy, I mean, enjoy the highs just as much as the lows and with the lows, figure out what you did wrong with them. Mm-hmm. Obviously master the basics, fall in love with those as well, along with the process and don't overcomplicate shit. Now it's good to be analytical and assess what does and does not work. But as you did mention, do not fall into paralysis by analysis. Awesome. And eat your damn veggies. (laughs) As Uncle Cliff would say, eat your broccoli, kids. (laughs) All right, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on for our second chat, our anniversary. Thank you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) I feel like my ending statement was the same as the last video, but who knows? No, that's perfect. (laughs) It's because it matters. Yeah. It's not sexy, but it's true. That's right. That's right. Where can people find you, man? Plug all the socials. Uh, Instagram at bathtub. B A F T U B and our coaching services at ATP Performance. Oh, cheap plug. Yeah. <laughs> James will like that. <laughs> <laughs> love you, James. <laughs> yeah. Love you, man. Shadow prep. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody, for watching. If you guys enjoyed the episode, please give it a like. Please follow this man, support him, support his coaching, and we'll see you guys in the next episode.